At AIA Australia, we're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards, like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA Thank CDM today. Thank you today. for jumping in on our XY Live. Apologies, we are running two minutes late, uh, two and a half minutes late, um, but that's all right. We'll just keep the suspense going. Um, so as people are kind of rolling in, um, we'll just quickly go around the room and ask about what was the best thing that happened to you this morning? So, Ray J, what was the best thing that happened this morning? I had a, an awesome SOA, actually. Um, it's quite nice. These guys are, what, five years out of retirement? Um, came through via an accountancy referral. They'd seen uh, an institutional planner in the past and were a bit sceptical of me and uh, my world before before they'd, they'd met me and apparently it was a bit of a struggle to get the account to, to make the appointment. But, um, mate, looks looks like we um, pulled through some awesome strategic stuff for them. So I don't know that there was any, um, any sort of product or anything. It was, just, it was just an awesome meeting. There was plenty of value I could add. It was just, you know, sometimes it's those nice ones that are, you know, it's just really easy to, to add, add value. Awesome. What about you, Matt? What was the best thing that happened to you this morning? Uh, excuse the shameless plug, but I uh, went into the Momentum Media offices and did a podcast with Alex uh, Vikovic around advisor innovation. So keep, keep your ears tuned for that. It was good fun. Pretty serious studio they've got there. Ah, cool beans. Cool beans. Yeah. Right, let's get started. So I'll just open up. Today we've got Matt Heine uh, from Net Wealth Group. Um, super excited uh, about hearing all these, all that uh, Net Wealth are doing and the US tech tour that he's just fresh off the boat or fresh off the plane back from. Um, and just before we get started, just want to give a plug to the Facebook group. If you're not in the Facebook group, get on it. Uh, conversations happening every single day about all types of discussions. Um, no product providers in there flogging their wares, just advisors helping out other advisors. Um, and also industry professionals there to um, help support uh, the advisors. So jump in the Facebook group. We're just going to link uh, to the xyadvisor.com slash community, um, fill out the form and you'll get invited to the Facebook group. So make sure if you're not in there, jump in. Um, and just want to say thanks to AIA for supporting XY Live. So Matt, first question, um, what is the US study tour and is it just a junket? Uh, it's a good question. In fact, I think that's a lot, a lot of our executive and board are asking the same question. Uh, so I was, I was lucky enough to go on a study tour with the Implemented Portfolio team uh, back in September. And it was a similar format in that it was a, it was a serious uh, sort of deep dive into Silicon Valley and also into San Fran. Um, and having gone sort of through a pretty intensive four days with those guys, I thought it was really important that I actually took a group of my clients over to see what was actually happening. Uh, I think it's very easy in Australia to to get busy in your day to day and seeing clients and sort of quickly dismiss all of the, you know, the big trends that are actually happening over, over in America. And it's not until you go over there and you realize that all of the stuff that we're hearing over here, and we can talk more about them in a moment, um, like artificial intelligence and big data and, um, and things like that, that you actually gives you a bit of a wake up call. Uh, so I think the main, main takeaway from the, um, from the conference was that there's a hell of a lot happening over there. Um, their industry is actually being disrupted. Australia hasn't been, uh, introduced to some of these big tech players coming in from a from a financial services perspective, uh, but it's coming, and we need to really start doing something about it. And so, uh, and so far, far from a junker, just to answer that question, uh, <laughs> it's been pretty heavy, pretty heavy days. We met uh, twenty companies, twenty seven presenters over three days. Uh, we had half of them come into the hotel, and half of them we went out to see uh, down in Silicon Valley. So. Uh, lunch at Google, uh, visit at the LinkedIn headquarters, uh, and uh, Palo Alto from a cybersecurity perspective. And uh, the Franklin Templeton team were kind enough to host us down in their campus uh, halfway to, to the valley. Fantastic. And when you say uh, you took some of your clients along, so what? Uh, when, when you're talking about your clients, who, who did you bring along? Were they advisors or fund managers? What, what are you talking about when you say clients? Yes, yeah, so there's a group of 55 that this went across. Um, of the 55, 30 were uh, financial planners. So um, either CEOs of uh, groups, uh, private wealth groups, or uh, pra practicing uh, practitioners. Um, so it was a, a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, but what was really nice was that it was 30 advisors who largely hadn't spent a lot of time together, uh, but really uh, had 
a good opportunity to sort of you know talk about what they're doing well in their businesses, what they're not doing well about, uh, not doing well in their businesses. Um, and I think there's a real bond formed over those three or four days where off the back of that, we're now um, looking to set up a range of different study groups uh, to sort of really explore some of the things that we learned over there. Awesome. Sounds great. So how you, you kind of alluded to it, but how is the tour structured other than not being a junket? Yeah, <laughs> other than not being. So there was definitely some, uh, some late night discussions about what we learned during the day. Uh, but basically, we, we tried to structure the, the content around, I guess, um, sort of big tech and, and mega, uh, mega trends. So uh, artificial intelligence. And we had companies that weren't necessarily related to financial services come in and talk to us and sort of walk through you know, what, what's happening in their world. Uh, we had a number of fantastic uh, financial planners from uh, from the Bay Area come in and talk to us about how they run their businesses and what they're doing, um, including a lady called Sabrina Lyle, who's uh, actually just got engaged to an Australian from Sydney. Um, but she's been uh, constantly um, you know, referred to as one of the best financial planners um, under 40 and doing some you know, really fantastic stuff in her business around, um, I guess it's young female tech entrepreneurs. And so it's a very uh, clear segment of the market and they've designed their service packages really clearly around um, this uh, sort of um, uh, this lady called Kate. So, what would Kate do? What would Kate want? Um, and everything that they do for Kate um, is to make her life easier and to uh, help her financial plan. One um, thing I, I'd sort of um, started to see, or it sounds like from from these US study tours, I was, I've sort of gone a couple of years back, was that um, finan- it's not it's not financial services businesses getting good at tech. It's actually tech businesses looking at financial services. Are you sort of finding that that's, that's still true? Yeah, so those two scary things. The first was that um, no longer are our clients actually comparing our services or our offering to other financial service um, firms or institutes. Uh, they're basically saying, well, what you deliver to me, uh, how does that compare to Amazon or Netflix or Facebook or the services that I interact with every day? So if we're not able to um, sort of meet market around you know, even things like how do we communicate with these firms, uh, we're going to become pretty irrelevant pretty quickly uh, because that's the new expectation of how services are delivered. Um, you know, Amazon has talked a lot, lot about if you can press a button next to your washing machine and have your washing powder arrive the next morning uh, without uh, entering any data uh, or speaking to anyone, that becomes the new norm. Um, so how do we start to deliver services in line with what these big tech companies are doing? Uh, the other scary, scary fact was, and I don't know the exact number, but uh, the majority of millennial and XY um, uh, people in America would trust Facebook or Google to manage their money before a bank or an institution. <laughs> well, that's so interesting. Trusting yeah, Facebook. With Absolutely. Money. Yeah. We, we um, trust them it, with everything else. They may as well have our account details. <laughs> yeah. Well, well t- talking of that, so the average number of data points that these big companies have on an individual now is around 5,000. So uh, these big tech companies and they're selling this data know 5,000 individual bits of information about pretty much every American um, and I was saying that for, for me to know myself better than I do now, I only need 30. So th- these big companies actually know a lot more about me than I actually know about myself. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's so relevant to pretty much everything we do. We need to know our clients back to front. We, you know, and, and all, every kind of touch point we have with product providers, they need to know so much information. So, I mean, that's, that's just going to be amazing. And I think it's good having me and Ray on this call because we geek out over startup and, and tech and yeah. we, we love this stuff. So um, robo advice is kind of, it's, it's, I mean, I'd love to hear your opinion on it. Has it come and gone? Um, and if so, what, what's kind of the next big wave of um, tech companies? What are they looking at? What's, what type of spaces are they looking at moving into? Yeah, so Robo, uh, the, the fantastic comment was made pretty early in the piece that um, it's no longer man against machine. It's man with machine against man without machine. Yeah. Uh, so when you think about that and the sort of the concept of bionic advice, um, Robo is still pretty basic. Uh, I think there's some people suggest that Robo is using artificial intelligence and you know, clever technology. Um, really, it's pretty basic rebalancing algorithms. There's nothing particularly smart about them. Um, so what we saw when we were over there was a number of um, you know, pretty serious artificial intelligence uh, players starting to, uh, uh, to sort of move into different markets. And um, from an industry that was sort of you know, under, under the radar even a couple of years ago, in 2015 alone, there was 45 billion spent um, by VC on uh, artificial intelligence companies, and that number is growing every year. And when you drive down to Silicon Valley, literally every second billboard that you see is some new artificial intelligence company popping up. Uh, so what that means for, for our industry is that one of the, um, the companies that we met with Sandland, uh, they're actually starting to run huge amounts of money using purely artificial intelligence. Um, and what that looks like is that for each asset class, 
Uh, they've got around 600 self-learning algorithms looking for different opportunities in each market. They've then got a master algorithm that's basically looking at which of the sub-algorithms uh, is doing uh, a good job of predicting and which ones are doing a bad job of predicting and then um, working with only the ones that are making uh, good ongoing predictions. Then they multiply that by eight, nine different asset classes and then they have a major, um, another couple of algorithms basically building a portfolio based on uh, a whole range of other inputs. So you've got the equivalent of something like 3,000 uh, you know, PhDs constantly learning on the job, but in real time. Um, and the returns that they've been able to generate uh, either at a stock level or an asset class level are just astounding, like so much better than we've been able to do, um, you know, purely using traditional methods. So that's pretty pretty interesting area, um, especially given that most people would suggest that artificial intelligence is still pretty dumb. So if artificial intelligence is dumb and it can drive a car from New York, uh, from a car park in New York to LA, uh, I hate to think what's going to happen when it actually starts to, to smarten up a bit. Uh, but that's also where it's exciting. So it's about looking as an advice industry. How can we partner with uh, these firms to do really cool stuff? And is there? I mean, that that's awesome from a from an asset allocation or a, or a investment perspective. And and I mm. guess that's kind of the the, the lower hanging fruit because it's quant quant analysis, right? You're just doing it at an aggregated level, really, really quickly, over and over again. Yeah, but Does, it's self learning. It's self learning is probably the key. Yeah. And self-learning, which is, you know, much quicker than me running off to a PhD and, and coming out five years later when the game's changed. Um, but what about what about the engagement to the client? So do, is the AI starting to get to the point now where it's like I'm dealing with um, someone's money who is uh, Googling this stuff like crazy when, when there's a bad article and, or, or, you know, when 7 o'clock news is, is saying the world's a horrible place? So is it sort of identifying and, and helping manage the, the client's behaviour and, and, I guess, fear? Yes, yeah, so I think that's, that certainly was flagged as the next frontier. So you're right that the things that are being built at the moment really around asset allocation and ignore the individual. Um, so I think that's probably a year or two away before they start to bring in that, that sort of information. Um, the other area, though, with artificial intelligence, which I think was fascinating, was just um, how, how they're using it to automate processes in their back office and to manage uh, multiple relationships on a very deep level. Uh, so you're probably going to start hearing a lot about chatbots. Um, so chatbots really are going to start really popping up across the whole industry. I saw an article this morning that Ubank has just launched a, uh, a chatbot to help people basically walk through their mortgage applications. Um, but chat, chatbots are just going to be another way of talking to and servicing your client. Um, we, we had a hackathon at NetWealth uh, about two weeks ago uh, where basically the whole business is uh, allowed to work on projects that they want to. So we had about eight teams working on different things on the last one. Um, we started to dabble in AI and chatbots, uh, and the guys in two days managed to spin up a, uh, a uh, basically an application where you could talk to Siri, uh, it, uh, ask it to log into your NetWealth account, uh, ask what the account balance was, and uh, and the chatbot called Netty uh, would actually talk back to you. Uh, so that's going to become increasingly, I think, the norm, uh, just as another way of engaging with your clients. I'm not saying it's going to replace what we do, uh, but if your client, and this is pretty common these days, goes to work and actually wants to start looking at their finances at 10 o'clock at night, um, they're going to want immediate answers. So if you can actually have processes in place where they can get those answers while they're asleep, happy days. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's amazing. So um, what I'd love to just back to this study tool. What are, what are the, like, maybe top three companies that you guys heard from that you're really keen on, you know, keeping an eye on over the next, you know, two to three years? Yeah, so personal capital is still one of my favourites. Uh, so got to meet with them uh, six months ago and also on the most recent trip. So Personal Capital was founded by Bill Harris, who was one of the original PayPal um, mafia. And basically, he took a view about five or six years ago that financial planning or bricks and mortar financial planning was fundamentally broken in America. Uh, and it was meaning that the cost to deliver an SOA, the cost to service clients was just far too high. Um, so he set up Personal Capital as initially, which was um, a way to aggregate all your accounts and sort of visually see what your net worth was, what the returns were. Um, and then very quickly launched a, um, an online video-based financial planning service. So they track around $370 billion of assets. Off the back of that, they know everything about their clients. They're able to send targeted messages um, suggesting when a client might need advice um, and then get them on a video call to basically deliver that advice and talk through um, the different scenarios. Uh, so they launched the financial planning a little while ago and subsequently they've launched a basic robo service as well to um, to manage the money that was coming off those conversations. What was fascinating though was that, um, and that's at about $4 billion, I think, under management now over a couple of years, um, about 40% of the people that are seeking advice and investing into that robo-service have more than a million dollars invested money uh, and would be 45 plus. 
So I think the, uh, the you know the thought that it's only for young investors or millennials with small amounts of money is quickly going out the window as people are just using new technology to better service the clients when and where they want to. Uh, so personal capital is really cool. Um, I think there's one that we didn't get to see this time called Penny, which is a uh, again it's a artificially driven uh, financial planning uh, assistant. Uh, so she'll actually help you with your spending habits and send you messages and encouraging words uh, along the way. Um, and there was a fantastic risk profiling tool over there called Totem, um, which does your traditional risk profiling, but then it brings in all of your banking and your Facebook feeds. So it's actually got a far better gauge on what your real uh, propensity for risk is as opposed to just what the five questions tell you. Uh, so no, no shortage of good companies over there. One thing you touched on, sorry, Phil, one, one thing you touched on, Matt, um, with personal capital is the aggregation thing. Um, yeah. And as a young advisor, it's probably one of the biggest things that I am screaming for. Um, yeah. A way, to, a way to do it really, really well, and I guess in a cheap way is, you know, is it your sense that this stuff is coming? Are, are people looking at this stuff? Big time. Uh, so I can't give away all the, uh, the the secret sauce, but we've just done our advisor tech survey, uh, which we'll be launching at the uh, Advisor Innovation Conference. And um, one of the things that came out of there was that still there's a, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 25, 30% of people are using cash flow tools in their financial planning businesses in Australia at the moment. Um, that number over the next five years is uh, expected to jump to 70 plus. Uh, so, and even um, in the next two years, there's a far larger percentage of financial planners that are looking at using it as part of their total value proposition. So, um, I actually think that's going to be one of the biggest new uh, sort of areas for technology enablement um, out of everything that we do. And cash flow isn't a glorified Excel spreadsheet, right? No, <laughs> ca ca cash flow is uh, far more about a actionable insights. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and I think I think yeah, the the move with robo advice and and it's pushing us advisors into more value add services. So that's why I think cash flow is a, kind of an easy one for advisors to move into because you know soon you know managing money is not really going to be our job because we can just click a button or uh, and and we get a robo solution with a risk profiling you know asset allocation. Um, so we've got to kind of move up that value chain in, in terms of what we do. Um, my next question is, why do you need to go to the US? Why fly, you know, 15 hours to get to the US? Aren't there enough uh, great tech companies um, based in Australia? Yeah, as I, as I said earlier, there's no tech company yet that's really made a mark on the Australian scene. Um, over in the States, in Silicon Valley, San Fran alone, there's something like 850 startup fintech firms uh, now for every one that starts up, there's probably a couple that are going out of business, um, but it's a real hot spot. And what, what I love about San Fran, and I was sort of thinking quite a lot about this, I don't think it's by chance that you've got the biggest companies, uh, tech companies in the world, all based in the one area. So what you notice when you go to San Fran, um, you know, to borrow from the castle, it really is the vibe. Um, everyone there is there uh, for the same reason, that is to solve the world's biggest problems. Um, so I started to think about it as sort of the, the three C's of Silicon Valley, um, which was curiosity. Everyone over there is really curious. So they're wanting to, you know, put a dent in the earth. They're wanting to make the world a better place and solve problems that couldn't be solved before. Um, collaboration is the other thing. They're incredibly happy to talk um, about their ideas and to share ideas with other people. And when you start sort of sharing big ideas with other really smart people that have also got big ideas, um, you get this sort of incredible multiplier effect where, um, the, the outcomes are just incredible. So uh, Michael Dunworth, who used to work for Midwinter, actually uh, went over there a couple of years ago and um, he's built up an incredible business using uh, blockchain and Bitcoin to transfer large yeah. you know, hundreds of millions of dollars around the world um, without exchange rates. Now, that idea came off the back of a late night conversation over pizza in a hacker house uh, with his now co-founder, um, but sort of never happy to sit still. He's built this amazing technology. He was like, okay, well, what, what's next? Chatting to a lot of people, what, what can I do next with this technology? So he came up with the, uh, he was sort of looking a few years ahead and he said, well, when, it, when all the cars go driverless and you're in a hurry and there's a driverless car in front of you and you're behind it, how do you overtake it? Um, and the best way to do that is to make a micro payment between cars. Uh, so I'll pay the car in front of me, you know, two cents or something so I can overtake it. He decided he wanted to be the gateway, the payment gateway between cars. So one of his early founders knows Elon Musk. So he sent an email to Elon to say, um, I've got this problem. Can we talk about it? I think I've got a great solution. So it's these sort of things that people are coming up with that you know I didn't even know was a problem. Uh, they're identifying them years ahead. Um, and then uh, the third C is capital. There is so much money floating around over there that people are literally throwing millions of dollars at these startups, um, which gives them the ability to really you know, throw the kitchen sink at these problems, um, as opposed to Australia where we're a bit more conservative. Uh, it's a good idea to actually have revenue and profit, and then you might put on a few more programmers, and it's quite a gradual 
uh, sort of process as opposed to saying, let's go raise $50 million, get 100 programmers and uh, see how we go. Yeah, so so sticking on that kind of US Silicon Valley versus Australian startup scene, um, Dylan's kind of asked a question about, uh, he mentioned Ray's article in IFA this week, which is fantastic, um, props to Ray, and mentioning, you know, a two-speed industry. Um, in terms of like Australian US, how far behind do you think we are from the US startup scene? Two, 10 years, 20 years behind them? really hard to say um as you know tech moves incredibly quickly uh so i think there's a lot more of them over there and they're looking at a lot more problems i mean robo is you know very last year uh they've all moved on from there and they're looking it really is looking at artificial intelligence and how you can start to really um, get huge insights into a huge number of clients and, and deliver these services on mass um, i'm not aware of anyone in australia that's really starting to invest into um, the new technologies that we were hearing about so um, I think the, the scary thing is, though, that a lot of the technology we saw over there um, is extremely portable. So it's, you know, it's things that people could bring over to Australia uh, and start to disrupt certain parts of the market. So it may or may not be a homegrown um, a fintech that actually that does, uh, does that in the future. Uh, what's the answer? Maybe a couple of years? Is, is, the res is there resistance with these guys coming across to Australia because of, market size i've kind of i've kind of had conflicted feedback which you know one says australia is just too small for these guys to be interested in but then the other one says well hang on we've got a real lazy retirement system that's got a whole bunch of wealth sat there and no one's looking at it so it's you know it's, it's, a, it's an attractive opportunity and I'm, i've kind of heard you know both both thoughts yeah so i think while a lot of these sort of early fintechs were trying to go um direct to consumer so be, um, better see um, that's changed totally in the States. It's now really about B2B. So all of the early robos are recognising that even with two or 300 million Americans, um, that it's going to be very hard to sort of uh, eke out a living um, if they don't partner with these big advice firms. Um, so I think over here, we're going to, again, start to see some of these technology companies partnering um, with advice firms and, and advisor networks. Um, and that becomes a pretty pretty viable proposition. Um, have you have you ever spoken with these guys who um, look at Australia and they see it's an attractive market and as Dylan asked just now, um, they see the regulation framework that they're in and just say, no? Nah. Well, I think that's a huge barrier. Um, personal capital, apparently Bill Harris actually came to Australia about three years ago and he was having a bit of a look around because he could definitely port what he's built overseas to Australia. Um, his main complaint was he hated our employment laws. Uh, in America, literally, if someone's not working out, you can walk up and fire them. Uh, and when he found out that you've got to give people warning and three months notice and uh, he sort of panicked and just said, it's not for me. Uh, so that's, it's not even just our regulation. I think it's the environment that we operate in. Because yeah. yeah, personal uh, capital have employed advisors. Is that their business model? Yeah, so I think uh, they've got around 40 or 50 um, salaried advisors who are basically all sitting at desks and doing video-based advice. Mm -hmm. They're Barclays, aren't they? No, um, owned by Bill and, and Venture Capital. Okay. They've raised, I think, close to 180 million, so private business. Okay. Um, I'd be interested in your views, actually. Um, spaceship uh, over here, I mean, that's probably the, the latest entrant that seems to be making a lot of noise. And by all accounts, they've been hugely <laughs> successful. <laughs> any, any views? Oh, there's, there's been plenty of views on, on the Facebook group. There's been some really good conversations happening. I think the, the major concerns are um, that, I mean, that I have and that others within the group have is, uh, the fees are, are really quite high, um, and yeah. and it makes sense. You know, they're a small, they're a small startup. They don't have the fund to justify or to, to have the ability to reduce their fees to be competitive. Um, yeah. And some of their investments aren't necessarily that sexy, which um, I guess they're they're the two main drawbacks that I've been hearing. Yeah, uh, but the fact is, uh, and this is probably a key to again what we saw overseas, people are happy to invest in an experience. So that's, that's the thing, the marketing is, is, is so strong, isn't it? You know, it's not until you actually take the time that us sort of got, you know, financial professionals that are curious, look under the bonnet and like, Meh. Um, but it's not the point, you know, the shiny face is enough to get people flocking to this stuff, right? Yeah, well, it was uh, $75 plus 1.6%. Uh, it's got to be one of the most expensive funds in Australia. Uh, and yet people are scrambling to be part of it. You know, there's a queue out the door uh, waiting for the early release. Uh, and that comes back to that you know, earlier comment about people are happy to trust uh, you know, Google and Facebook uh, to manage their money if they think it's a good story and if, they, if, it, if the marketing and if the message aligns to their values. Yeah, I, I, yeah totally agree. I, I, 
I think it's a good thing. Any anything that can kind of challenge the status quo. Look, we've got so much money sitting in superannuation with so many um, disengaged uh, consumers. So anything to engage consumers. Sure, there's some people saying, well, you know, there's the, the fees are really high, and you know, they're they're just marketing hype. And you know, how do we compete as advisors when you've just got someone advertising on Facebook? Click a few clicks, and you roll your super over um, mm-hmm. without an insurance offering within the fund. Um, it's it's difficult for us advisors, um, but but I think it's it's great to be challenged and to yeah, think yeah. about it. Perhaps, perhaps you know you can have an opinion as, to, as of, of spaceship and and the intricacies of that. Perhaps the helpful view is is what spaceship represents, which is you know a, a, an, an actual disruptor to to what we've seen before and and the experience yeah. and and you know maybe that's what we as an industry need to learn. Yeah, well, I think that's the point. What can we learn from it, or what do we do about it? Uh, we get better at telling our message and really articulating what the value is that we add. Um, and I mean, they've, they've nailed it. But uh, Matt, I'd be interested in your views on it, as because I mean, they're not really a direct competitor to me because I can recommend clients move to Spaceship, and I mean, it's not on my APL, but really, that's not that hard to get to get over that barrier. But you, as Net Wealth, they're, they're 100 percent direct competitor to you. How how are you guys thinking about it? Yeah, I think, I mean, the first thing is the supermarket is 2.7 trillion. So uh, there's a lot of uh, contestable market. We've got about 1% of that, if, if not less. Um, I, I just think it's really interesting to watch it. Would I invest my own money? Definitely not. Um, am I seriously impressed by what they've built in a very short period of time? Absolutely. Uh, so again, we're sort of looking at, you know, they send out uh, emails, which are basically plain text uh, from the CEO. There's no sort of fancy email marketing. Uh, it's just very clear messages. It's about... Uh, communicating what's in the portfolio better uh, and sort of just building really sort of uh, uh, you know, aspirational messaging around it. And so would you guys think about um, releasing another product, you know, direct to consumer kind of, you know, uh, let's call it rocket ship. Um, it's all administered under net wealth. No, I think we're, we're pretty comfortable where we're positioned at the moment. Uh, so, we'll, but we'll watch it and, and we'll learn from them and see what, what lessons we can bring into our world. Yeah. So number one, you're going to start using plain text text in your all your email. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I'm I'm struggling with that one a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, it, it is definitely clever stuff. Uh, overseas again, uh, I think they've they've looked at what Wealthfront has done. I imagine so. Wealthfront sort of one of the robos over in Silicon Valley. Uh, anyone that's in tech basically went to Wealthfront because that's just what you did if you're in tech. Uh, so I, I think they've probably trans- transported a lot of the uh, the learnings from there. It uh, definitely helps having Michael Cannon Brooks uh, saying his super is there, which who knows, that could be the, the first hundred million. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I mean, Wealthfront, correct me if I'm wrong, they, they've now gone B2B. They're working with advisors now. Yeah, they all have. So if you look at SigFig, which is a fantastic um, a site, which is robo slash uh, sort of data aggregation and news aggregation, uh, Betterment, Wealthfront, actually Wealthfront may not have yet, but certainly Betterment and uh, and Sigby have partnered up with you know the likes of UBS uh, and Fidelity and some of the big wire houses. Uh, the other one that we didn't get to see, uh, which is apparently incredibly impressive, is the Vanguard operation. Yeah, mm. you got to go for a drive to get there. You... Well, I think that that next study trip to New York. <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so we did talk about um, Spaceship, but are, are there any other Australian startups that you you guys or you put yourself personally are, are keeping an eye on? Yeah, there's quite there's a lot, actually. Um, I think some really interesting uh, sort of research providers. So Macro View is one that's sort of popping up quite a bit where uh, it'll allow you to sort of research and build thematics around international stocks and then buy them. Uh, you've got a number of the... Um, uh, so, yes, a macro view. Self Wealth, I think, is doing some interesting uh, stuff around that sort of community based investing where it's, uh, you know, wisdom of the crowd. Uh, if they can get lots and lots of people on the platform, uh, you're able to then sort of see who's holding what stocks and who's buying and selling and also follow different portfolios. So, Self Wealth uh, are raising money. Are you guys investing in them? I didn't know they were actually. So, I'm pretty uh, sure I think they are, or they're IPOing sometime. Really? Okay. That's, I think that's a um, pro yeah, okay, I'll have to have a look at that. But, but um, the other one, Acorn. I mean, Acorn raised money directly from their members not that long ago. Um, they raised about, I can't remember, it was about 5,000 shares they were offering. Um, Acorn's doing some great stuff, and that's probably the one 
uh, to keep an eye on. So they're starting to move into a whole range of new uh, areas, including sort of that actionable insight. So they've got your banking feeds. Uh, what can we now tell you about uh, your spending and what, what might you be able to do better? Uh, Money Brilliant, and I'm sure you guys use all of these cash flow tools. Uh, Money Brilliant's got a really nice interface, uh, pretty easy to use and very intuitive. Uh, who else have I been playing with at the moment? Um, uh, Tip, Tip Ranks is not an Australian one, but it's a uh, an international stock research tool that we've integrated into our environment recently, um, which basically goes and ranks all of the analysts in the US, uh, then gives them a star rating and also uh, gives you a, a rating for every stock. So it'll then say Apple followed by all these research analysts. Here's their bottom range and their top range. Uh, here's what the hedge funds are buying. Here's what the directors are doing. And here's what all the bloggers are saying. So pulls all the data into a really nice and easy interface. So uh, those are a lot of good companies out there. Yeah, I mean, I think I think Acorns for me is just absolutely nailing what they're doing, and they're, and they're actually an interesting story because they're they're a US company, and and uh, you probably know a bit more about their story, but um, the uh, Australian company is like licensed their technology. Is that how the is that how Acorn Australia works? I believe so, and um, uh, Acorns. If I get this wrong, uh, feel free to correct me at some point, but. Um, the Acorn model is is fascinating in that it's not actually about funds under management or making money off the portfolio or the account fee. Um, they need to get a critical mass because what actually happened in the States was um, it's now a frequent flyer program. So they realised that if Target offered a 10% additional uh, top up to clients that um, bought uh, goods at Target, their sales went through the roof. So basically now they're sharing part of the uplift in sales with Acorns and that's where they're making the bulk of their money. So if you mm -hmm. shop at um, Safeways or if you shop at Woolworths uh, and you've got an Acorns account, we'll add 10 cents or we'll add 20 cents. So all of a sudden you've got 100,000 or 200,000 people on Acorns that are actually shopping at particular places because they get an additional roundup. Yeah, With, yeah. I, one, one thing I think um, you know, is, is quite appealing is, is the fractional stuff. So you don't need to save five grand to talk to an advisor yeah. for two grand to invest three. Um, uh, one of the questions coming through is the idea of the fractional property, so brick X, and I know there's a yeah. couple of others. Do you, do you have a strong opinion on, on the way this stuff's working at the moment? Uh, so I met with the BrickX guys uh, about a month ago. Um, it's a really nice interface, and I think what they've done uh, is, is pretty impressive, actually. Uh, so obviously that ability to uh, to invest into a small part of a house. So their, their model is a bit different to, say, Domicon. Uh, Domicon will do a bit of a crowdfunding exercise uh, on behalf of clients. They'll whereas BrickX will go and find a really good property and then uh, basically break it into bricks and sell those bricks on their um, exchange. Um, but the, and they're the first to say that a lot of the activity they think is actually people testing it out, but they've done something like 1,200 or 2,000 um, brick exchanges already. Um, and it works exactly like an online trading site. So you sort of, you know, so I'll have one brick on that property, one brick on that property, and you can build out a diversified uh, portfolio pretty quickly. Uh, one of the great ideas they actually emailed through, I think it was Chris Bates, uh, suggested we have a chat. Uh, was um, if the first if the first homeowners scheme through super comes good, doesn't it make sense to actually let first homeowners invest directly into property to start with while they grow their deposit uh, and then convert it into an actual house? And I thought that was pretty pretty sensible actually, and you know, using BrickX or a service like Domicom actually allows them to get that true property exposure whilst they're saving for their first home deposit. Keep pace with the asset class you're ultimately going to buy into, right? Exactly. Sense. Yeah, it's still very early days, uh, and I think it will take a while for people to really catch on for these things to become mainstream. Um, but uh, all kudos to them for trying to sort of do something new and interesting. Yes. Yeah, so, so to, speaking about Chris Bates, he's asked a question about um, financial planning companies in the US. Um, are you seeing any that are nailing the service proposition using technology with their younger clients? Uh, so personal capital, again, uh, whether it's younger clients or older clients, I mean, their whole proposition is around technology and they've just relaunched their whole uh, client dashboard, uh, which looks looks incredible. Uh, they, they made a good comment, which was they spent a lot of the money that they'd raised actually building out a really, really rich uh, mobile experience. So being able to do uh, everything on the phone. Now, we've also started talking about mobile first. Uh, they quickly realised, though, that when people were wanting to really do a deep dive into their finances and have a really... Um, you know, good look at what's going on, that they actually want to move on and do it at home on their desktop. So they've now had to really start investing heavily back into the desktop, uh, mm. back to the future in some ways. Um, so personal capital, uh, I think video uh, is going to continue to become you know, more and more uh, prevalent within advice. 
Uh, I struggle a bit with people that say, that still comment that their clients aren't interested or won't do video interviews. Um, I mean, this is a great example of how easy it is to get a group of people together. Um, my, my son, who's two years old, uh, travel a lot. I'm FaceTiming him every night. That's what he's going to grow up with. It's going to become just a normal mm. part of our communication. So um, video is going to get more and more, um, I think, prevalent. Uh, and I think these cash flow aggregation tools are going to become really important. Uh, and there's a whole lot of other stuff which we'll uh, tell you at the Advisor Innovation event. <laughs> Good plug. <laughs> um, and just, just going back to personal capital, I'd be interested, and I'm sure you, you asked them, why did they go the route of having salaried advisors instead of partnering and licensing their technology with uh, you know, self-employed advisors? Didn't actually ask that question. Uh, Maybe next year uh, when you get Yeah, no, I will. I, I mean, at the moment, they basically own the whole business and the value chain. Um, mm. And... What they've built is because they're tracking three hundred and sixty million dollars, billion dollars worth of people's assets. That's effectively their database of leads. Uh, so I'm not sure they'd want to be sharing that necessarily with other people. But look, it's it's a good question. Yeah, the the reason I ask is because having looking at personal capital from you know almost no financial advice business in Australia can replicate that. We don't have uh, the access to investment, um, and it, it's yeah. difficult. A few people, um, you know, looking at that. Vince Gully's one who's kind of um, looking at that kind of model with Life Sherpa. But um, for Chris Bates, for myself, for Ray, we can't really just set up a you know that that technology solution. But if there was a personal capital who uh, licensed that software or sold that software to self-employed advisors, then obviously we could look at that kind of a model for the self-employed yeah. market. So Stig Fig is definitely doing it over in the States. Um, as far as your comment there, uh, I'd probably say watch this space. That's an area that I really want to be uh, looking into and doing more in. Uh, one of the key things that I took away from the most recent visit was with everything that's going on, um, net wealth is a business. We actually have a responsibility to the advice community to help you guys leverage this new technology. Uh, you know, we've got the in-house know-how and the skills and the people to actually start to play with a lot of this technology, but make it extremely accessible to, to the IFA market. Uh, and that's that's what we're focused on. So it's you know, platforms a piece of it, uh, but how do we actually provide that full offering so that you know you log into our portal, you might launch Zoom or Sweetbox or uh, the, the video conferencing, but that automatically links back in. Uh, to what we're doing uh, and it might also then you know, bring through your, your banking and all the rest of it. So uh, yeah, it won't be long before there's good services out there. Yeah, fantastic. So are you, is Net Wealth or Matt Heine, are you guys actively investing in Australian startups at the moment? Uh, no, we're not. Uh, we're investing pretty heavily back into our own business. Uh, so yep. that's taking up most of our resources. Um, and I think the other thing is that it's, it's pretty tough at being an investor into fintech because you really do need to take that highly diversified uh, portfolio approach uh, because picking one you've got not a lot of chance of success you need to be investing in probably 10 or 20 or 30 of these fintechs um, like any uh, portfolio except the, the rate of success is far um, far less with a fintech I guess because um, it's just it's such a difficult market to crack uh, worth having a look at, at some point there's a lot of uh, fintech uh, crowding uh, fund crowding platforms popping up overseas one called iAngel uh, out of Israel allows you to go in and buy into these, you know, huge tech floats in Israel and America at very low levels. So you can build out a portfolio uh, of, of fintechs, you know, it might be a thousand dollars into each one. Um, and there's also one called Our Crowd, where they go and do a lot of the due diligence uh, on the fintechs and then they put forward their recommendations uh, and then they can either build a pre-designed uh, portfolio of fintechs for you or you can go and pick the ones that you want to buy. Yeah, so are you, so you guys plan looking at just building everything in house, or are you going to maybe consider doing what Acorn has has done, uh, or Acorn Australia has done, and, and looked at uh, US technologies and then brought it over and bringing it over to Australia? Is that the, is that the plan? Yeah, so I mean we're we're very much build by uh, build by partner. Uh, we know what our core competencies are, uh, and we know where we're probably likely to partner with someone else. So you know, Tip Ranks would be a good example. We were never going to go and build a uh, you know, machine learning, big data, um, analyst ad aggregation uh, software. So we basically bought it from Israel, uh, integrated it into our environment, uh, and that's very much uh, part of our plan in the future. Uh, just a quirky question now that you've mentioned Israel. My, my, my um, understanding is that's an awesome incubator for fintech. Is there is anything interesting coming out of there that, that we're not seeing in Silicon Valley? Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at it, except it is, uh, I do know it's an incredibly exciting uh, tech scene over there. Um, basically, uh, when I met with um, one, the lady from Angel Investors, uh, they live in the desert. 
Um, they don't have oil. They've got a lot of angry neighbours. And so they basically had to build a, um, a whole tech scene to protect themselves and to basically survive um, in pretty arid conditions. Um, so what happened was that through this sort of military um, tech focus, um, part of the government is uh, they're basically putting people through uh, high tech um, sort of learning and um, teaching and programming from a very young age in life, uh, which is now starting to blossom into a whole lot of other areas. Um, so they're looking at how do they use uh, anti-missile and radar technology um, for cybercrime. Uh, so they're taking all of these sort of things that were built for military purposes and adapting them to real world problems. Um, so I think that's going to be the uh, one of the most exciting tech places in the world. Uh, it's kind of interesting just because by virtue of a different life experience, you're you're solving a different problem, right? Like you say, Silicon Valley are trying to solve life's problems. Yeah. Um, on the other side of the world, you've got something perhaps not too dissimilar, but starting from a totally different reference point. It'd be kind of cool to see what where that marries up and, and you know what we end up seeing uh, come out of that. Yeah, no, I'd love to visit Israel and check it out. Yeah, well, I mean, the two examples was in the US, you've got a startup company looking at paying another car two cents just to get in front of them. And in Israel, you're looking at startup companies to use anti-missile technology to, yeah. to solve some other issues. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, it's great stuff. Been a fantastic talk. Um, I'm sure you'll do an Israel tech tour in the next few years because I think it is like one of the top, in, at least in the top five in terms of startup mm. numbers and investment in Israel. Um, it is it is a massive scene over there. Um, so th thanks, Matt, for um, all your input. Um, and I know if you're not already in the Facebook group, you're going to join the Facebook group and answer any follow-on questions. That we'll have. Absolutely. Love to. We'll definitely have some follow-up questions. This is always a big topic, technology. Um, and I know you're going to be um, sharing your survey results with the XY Advisor crew as well. And there's, there's also, last plug, Financial Standards done a great write-up on the whole of the uh, Silicon Valley trip with all of the sessions and, and learning. So that, that's being released today. Make sure you download it and have a read. And uh, yeah, look forward to chatting further. Fantastic. Thanks, well, thank you very much, Matt. And, and just want to say I've got massive respect for you, Matt. Uh, you're running a big business. Net Wealth is, isn't a small player in the train industry, but you're always very visible and very... Um, uh, you have a lot of access to, to lots of advisors and it's uh, very commemorable um, because there's not many, uh, you know, platform CEOs who spend as much time with advisors as, as you and Michael do. I really appreciate that. Um, so thank you everyone for watching. Make sure you jump in the Facebook group. We're going to chuck a link in the chat channel again. Um, so sign up, jump in. And so thank you, Matt, again. Thanks, Ray, for joining us and we'll see you all next week. Thanks, guys.